Did I make you guys laugh? Oh, is this the center? Hello. Is that all the people in it? Hello. Hi. Oh, that's more like it. Um, I'm getting a bit of feedback on the microphone and it's not standing up. The great facilities at your school, it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Yes. Even at the back? Yes. Oh, wow, there's a lot of kids in here. This is really, really good. When I was your age, this is the kind of thing I would have skipped. I would have said, who's this guy I think he is coming to talk nonsense to us? But I'm glad that I can assist in helping you guys miss a lesson. It's an hour, right? It's an, yeah? Oh, that's perfect, that's perfect. You guys owe me one because you missed the lesson. What are you missing? <laughs> science, maths? English. English. Oh, I like English. Oh, who's missing science? Yeah, let's make some noise for everybody that's missing science. Woo! <laughs> everybody that's missing maths? Yeah. Oh, woo, woo, woo. <laughs> I really appreciate it. You having me here, as you can tell from my accent, I'm from London, um, United Kingdom. Woo, are you from London as well? <laughs> you from London as well? Yeah, you, you don't want to make noise. London is freezing, especially this time of year. You guys got the good weather over here, so I'm enjoying my time here. Um, I really appreciate being here. All, with that being said, I am from London, and if there's any words I say or I speak too fast, you don't understand me, feel free to put your hand up or feel free to just tell me to slow down, or tell me to shut up, or just heckle me. Whichever one works best for you guys. Um, I'm supposed to be here today to kind of speak to you guys, and in a sense, I'll inspire you, I guess, to tell you about my experience and how I came to the point where I created pieces like that. Because a lot of people see me and they say that, oh, wow, you know, four million people are watching, Oh, here comes the latecomers. Don't worry, take a seat, it's okay, don't worry. We'll put you in detention afterwards. <laughs> a lot of people see me and say, wow, you've done this, you've done that. It's all because you hated school and you dis disproved the current um, education system. But firstly, I want to clarify something. I don't actually hate school. I, I, just, say, I just put that in the title to get YouTube views. But <laughs> I'm joking. I don't actually... I don't actually hate school, I hate, I hate, what I meant was when I said that is I hate the concept behind the current system. I hate the concept in which the education system is structured. And I believe education is a lot deeper than what we're taught on a regular basis. And I wanted to convey that message and the only way I could have conveyed it was by telling you guys that I hate school. Because you see, what I hate about school is the infrastructure. I'm, I'm, I'm not an activist. I'm not a politician, I'll never be a politician, I hate politics. I'm not a lecturer, I'm not a teacher. I'm just a dreamer. I'm a person who likes to believe the concept that anything is possible if you just set your mind to it. And I believe when I was in school, I was taught that everything is a certain way. I was taught that Hamlet is written this way because of this. I couldn't interpret Hamlet the way I wanted to read it. I couldn't interpret Shakespeare the way I wanted to read it. I mean, if the guy gets stabbed in the chest, I have to believe it's some profound explanation for etc. But he just got stabbed in the chest. Lots of people get stabbed in the chest a lot. You know, you know, you know what I mean? That, that's, how I, that's how I understand stuff. I mean, I'm told, you know, if, if, if Mary has two lemon cakes and then she adds four lemon cakes, I don't even like lemon cake. You know what I mean? Why, why, why do I care about stuff like this? And, and the whole premise is behind school, which I was taught. So it wasn't, it wasn't learning. I've never had a problem with learning. I love learning. I love learning new things. But what I had a problem with was the fact that I always had to understand that one plus one equal two. I didn't, I didn't understand why did I even have to add one and one to equal two? Why couldn't I choose what I wanted to add? Because when you get into the wide world and in the reality I was living, one plus one never equal two. There was never any one outcome for every scenario. And in my school, I was always trained. I hope your school's a lot better, but in my school, I was always trained that there's only one way to do stuff. And I, I had to reject that idea. I couldn't deal with the possibility of living my entire life with somebody telling me how and what, some, how and what something should be done and the way it, it can happen. There's a saying, 
which impacts a lot on me. And I think we're not told enough. You know, I was never really inspired. I think a great teacher will always inspire you. Most of your favorite teachers, you may not even like the subject, but they inspire you to like that subject. And there's a saying which says, men can move mountains. And a lot of people will take that frequently and they won't really understand it. If I say to you, a man can move mountains, people will say that's just a saying. I don't, I don't believe that. And for a long time, I didn't believe it. I thought it was just a saying. But then I came across a story. There's a story, this is a true story, I kid you not. There's a guy in India, but well, he's dead now. It's not funny that he's dead. That, that, was, not, that was not a laughing point, maybe I didn't phrase it well. <laughs> but he, he's a great guy. Um, he's, he was a guy who lived, I think in 1870 or 1970s, like I'm terrible with dates, like I said, I hate maths. Um, he's a guy called Dashraf Manjihi. Now this is a true story. You can go and Google this when you get home. Dashraf Manjihi in the 1970s, his wife became very ill. She became extremely ill. She became ill to the point where she was on the verge of death. Now the only option, thank you very much for the subtlety as well. <laughs> now the only option for Dashraf Manjihi was to take his wife to the hospital. But now the issue with this was the nearest hospital was 70 kilometers away. 70 kilometers. Stand, standing in between him and the hospital was a massive mountain. Now unfortunately, when you do come from a poor environment, you're subject to these conditions and they don't always pan out the way you want them to. And unfortunately, his wife died. After his wife died, he made it his prerogative to make sure something like this would never, ever happen again. So he began digging through the mountain for 22 years. 22 years. I kid you not, I'm telling you this on Google. For 22 years, he dug through the mountain. He dug through the mountain until after 22 years, he reduced the distance from the hospital from 70 kilometers to one kilometer. And this is a true story. Dashraf Manjihi. And when I read this story, and when I read stories like this, it makes me understand that there's no limitations that can be placed on life. There's people who are either going to see the obstacles and the mountains in front of them, and they're going to let them dictate the circumstance. And there's people who are actually going to break down these mountains. I actually, wrote, I actually, as you know, I'm a spoken word artist, so whenever I do get the chance, I like to express myself through spoken words. And I actually wrote a piece that was inspired by this story. It's, it's very short, it's not as long as the one on YouTube. Is it okay if I share it with you? Yes. You don't have a choice anyway. <laughs> I'm, I'm taking away your science and math time, so that's cool. It's called Two Types of People, and it goes like this, just before I carry on. Right. <laughs> there are Two types of people in this world. Those who are inspired and those who inspire. Those who constantly long for and those who acquire. No idea is original. Yes, there is truth in this. But the person who has the strength to implement this idea always is. Because some people have dreams and chase them while others sleep waiting to be awakened, unaware that we can make a difference in our existence through hard work, resilience, and persistence. Because a man that wishes to move mountains must first start by shoveling pebbles from the base and realize that no matter how long it takes, a man can move mountains. And most of you will think this is just a saying and the majority won't believe me. But when you get a couple minutes on your PC, Google Dashraf Manjihi, because a man can move mountains. Success is a ladder. Few of us will find it. Even less of us will have the strength to climb it. Afraid of the prospect of spending your whole life climbing. But don't let your success define you. Let your success be defining. There's a picture on Facebook of a guy that's mining. He gave up when he was this close to the diamond. 
Because people that change the world do not let the world change them. Because some of us are meant to be amazed and others are meant to be amazing. Thank you very much. So just, just to carry on from where we left, left off, I want to tell you my story. I want to tell you the importance of thinking outside the box, thinking outside of everything that is usually conveyed as what is right and what is wrong. I mean, even being in San Francisco, um, everyone knows Levi Strauss, right? Everyone knows Levi jeans, right? Yeah, everyone's got some Levi jeans, uh, yeah. And when I was young, I couldn't afford no Levi jeans, so we had to um, improvise. Prime, oh, you don't have Primark here. That joke is not going to work. <laughs> um, but yeah, but I mean, even his thinking, his thinking initially, everyone came to San Fran for the gold rush, and he, ca and he came to sell them pickaxes and sell them for the tools. So while no one made money off the gold, he made money off selling them the tools, and then he realised their pants were tearing apart. So we took his tents that he was selling them and made them into jeans. He made the first jeans pants. So it's all about thinking outside the box. And that's something that took me so long to figure out myself. When I was young, when I was younger, um, <laughs> I, I was a very out-of-the-box thinker. The first thing, who remembers the first thing they wanted to be ever when they were young? I'm sure no one can match up to what I wanted to be. Who remembers? Do you remember what you wanted to be when you were young? What was, what was an entrepreneur? An entrepreneur? Oh, you're a lot more productive than me. What about you? Football player. Oh, wow, that's more like it. What about you? A Formula One driver. A Formula One driver. That's nice, man. That's ambitious. Anyone else? What's it? Teacher. Oh, teacher. That's in interesting. <laughs> I'm joking. Give a round of applause for the... That's amazing. That's amazing. When I was young, I didn't want to be any of these things. I was far more ambitious. My goal is I wanted to be a superhero. That, that, that was my primary goal. I, <laughs> I, I, I used to read comic books. I used to read Spider-Man. I used to read Batman. I used to read everything. And I, I legitimately wanted to be a superhero. I mean, I started making tools. I started making my uniform. I started making everything. <laughs> You know, and I was waiting until I hit puberty so my, my powers could manifest and I could really take it, you know, really take it to the next level. So um, it happened one time when I was in school and we was asking everybody um, what they wanted to be and everyone was coming out with, you know, good answers, you know, firemen, you know, some people ambitious astronauts, you know, some people were more sensible teachers. And then I said I wanted to be a superhero and then the silence was just... Just deafening. And at that point, obviously, it wasn't entirely feasible for me to want to be a superhero, because superheroes don't get paid. I didn't realize that till later. But, <laughs> but I, I, I wanted to be a superhero, and I, and I realized that. But at that moment, that silence, that had a huge impact on me. Because not only did it make me realize that I couldn't be a superhero, that's the earliest, earliest memory of me allowing myself to be defined by what other people thought of me, you know what I mean? When I went home, you know, I, I ripped everything apart. I said, no, I'm, I'm going to try and do something else. So the second thing I wanted to be is, OK, I can't be a superhero. I want to be an artist. I want to draw comic books. So that's the next thing I wanted to be. I put my blood, sweat and tears into all that art. Then when I got to a certain age, in, in the UK, you get to an age where you get to choose what you want to, to an extent, major in, but at a, at a high school level. And art was one of the options. And my mum said to me, why do you want to do like, why do you want to do art? You know, artists don't get paid until they're dead. You're not going to make any money of art. What's the, what's the point of doing art? And she made me pick French. And I was, I was like, why would I want to do that? I don't I don't want to do French. I have no passion at all for French. But once again, I neglected my own self belief, and I let her dictate what she wanted me to do. So I went on. I went on to college, and I did. I did French. College is different in the UK. It's kind of like high school again. So I majored in French and I failed French drastically. I got E in French because I hated French. I never went to any of the French lessons. So then I went to university. Now going to university, by that time I'd given up on my superhero dreams. I'd given up on my drawing um, artistic dreams and I decided that I was going to be a lawyer. Because I enjoyed reading 
and I wanted to write. But then once again, they said, why would you want to be a writer? The only thing you do as a writer is perhaps, you know, write books that will never get published. So I said, I'll be a lawyer. Lawyer made the most sense. That was the best thing for me to do. So for the next three years, I took time studying law, hours in the library, like I said, nights with Red Bull keeping me awake, going all the way until my graduation. Now, between the time I graduated and my last year, because I was barely going to lectures anyway, I was in my room sleeping more times than I was in lectures, something happened to me. There was an event, and someone said to me, do you want to come and perform at this event? It's a long story behind why he asked me to perform, because people just don't ask you to perform, but he asked me to come and perform at this event, and I thought, oh, let me do a little bit of spoken word, a little bit of poetry, you know, just, just to pass the time, something to do. So I took to the stage to perform for the first ever time. And the experience was phenomenal, it was amazing. And I said to myself, you know, I really like doing this. This is something that I enjoy doing. But how am I gonna make money off this? I can't make no money off this, <laughs> it don't make no sense. So I went back to doing law. Now graduating is one of the most scariest things you guys are ever gonna face in your life. Whether you graduate from college or you graduate from high school, is because for the first time in your life, you experience what we like to call as the real world. You know, you wake up when you want. You have to find a way to make ends meet. You have to make everything feasible. When I graduated, I realized that I hated law. Now I had a decision to make. Am I gonna do this for the rest of my life? Something that I have no passion about, but something everyone else tells me to do, or am I gonna do something that I believe in? If you don't take anything away from today, I just want you to take one thing away, is that if you believe in something, pursue it. Because that's how my journey started. I said, you know what? I could go and do law, but I want to do this, this spoken word. I want to do it, I want to do, I want to do it. Although there's no money in it, I don't see how I'm going to make money in it. This is what I believe in, and this is what I wanted to do. And believe me, the next four years was extremely, extremely, extremely difficult. My first job, I was working at um, a checkout um, in a supermarket, and that was cool, you know, I was working there, but it always kept on conflicting with my spoken word, kept on conflicting with the events that I had, or the showcases that I wanted to do. So eventually, I got fired from that job. I got another job working in the supermarket. Same thing, kept on conflicting. And at the time, I was trying to pay my bills, but I was like, I believe in this, so if an event comes on, a lot of people say they want to do something, but when it comes time to choose, they're afraid to make the decision. If I was supposed to be at work on Monday, and I knew there was an event on one Monday that was going to take me further, I would go to the event. I don't advise it because I got fired again. And then I had a third job in which I was a cleaner. Now you guys have not experienced anything unless you've done cleaning. I used to clean in a gym. Now a gym, when you clean in the toilets, it's worse because guys come in there with no clothes on, walk around, wipe themselves with a towel, then throw it on the floor, etc. I mean, my, my, my gym was so bad that someone once took a dump in the shower. In the shower. How do you take a dump in the shower? Like, I can't even imagine, imagine the logistics of that. How do you bend down, you know what I mean? <laughs> where, where, where does all that come from, you know? But I suppose with all that training, they might be quite flexible and they manage to pull it off. So, <laughs> so someone takes a dump in the shower and as a, as a cleaner, it's my job to pick that up. And I remember that day clearly, I mean, picking this up, it was like to me, what am I doing with my life? I said, I'm qualified to go and start practicing law. Why am I still chasing this thing that, I, that, that is not so certain, and I'm not sure, but it makes me happy. Why, why am I still chasing it? Because I can be a lawyer, I can, I can be working professional, you know, I can get um, a certain amount of money. I, I, I can do that. But as a cleaner, I did my job, then eventually, as a story of my life, I got fired from that job again. So then it came to the year 2011. Now, one of the biggest obstacles any of you guys are going to face when you decide what you want to do or want to create your own reality, as I like to call it, is going to be the thing we all have, well, if you're fortunate enough to have, your parents. My mum has always been my biggest obstacle ever. And she said to me, listen, Sully, you need to get your act together. I want you to go and finish your diploma and masters and do this, etc., etc., and make something of yourself. 
And I said to her, Mom, I don't want to do this. And we, got, we went into fights. We got into battles, back and forth, back and forth. I was sleeping one day, and I felt something hit the side of my head. And I'm thinking, what's that? Like, you know, you're just sleeping. I felt something hit the side of my head again. I woke up, and this woman was throwing shoes at me. <laughs> She's, she's throwing shoes at me, saying, listen, I'm sick and tired. We have to get act together. So at that point, I said to her, I knew there was no way I was going to stop doing what I do. I believed in it. And I said to her, mom, give me until December 2012. If things don't work out, I work this job. If things don't work out, then I'll go and do the law. I said, give me until December 2012. So I was working, same time, hustling my spoken word. I discovered YouTube, started to put my videos up, no tractions coming in, you know. I've got hundreds of videos. Some people have seen one or two, I've got hundreds. January, still nothing's happening. February, still nothing's happening. We get to October, nothing's happening. We get to September, and now my mum's calling me every day, you know. She's like, oh, Sully, so have you started applying for jobs? Have you started looking at the master's degree? Have you looked at qualifications? I said, mum, 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 December. And she goes, but December's literally around the corner. And what I tell you, you know, this is the power of belief. I kid you not. It got to the second week of December. My manager called me into the office. And they said, what I did was pretty stupid. I was working for a company at the time. And I was trying to do anything to get YouTube views. So I uploaded a video on YouTube, which was, at, I was working for Nike, which was talking about one of Nike's trainers. So my manager called me into the office and said, oh, um, we've seen this video of you. I said to him, that's not me. Obviously, it was blatantly me talking. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said to me, he said, this is a true story. He said to me, you know, this is um, defamation to the company. You're working in a company capacity. We can't, we can't keep you on anymore. I kid you not. So that's the fourth time I've been fired. So it's like the second week of December, I don't have, any I don't have a job. My mom's calling me on the phone. I'm thinking, what am I going to do? And just that same week, that same week, I had to go back in for my review. I uploaded a video onto YouTube. I think the date of that was the 9th or the 12th. I can't remember what date, it was after the 2nd. But if you can check the date on YouTube of when I uploaded that. December 2012, I put that video, why I hate school but love education. One week later, that video had 2.5 million views on YouTube. And since then, my life has never been the same. Last week, I had breakfast with Will Smith. Who says they have breakfast with Will Smith? Will Smith called me to have breakfast with him. He was talking about Independence Day and his life, and I was just sitting there like, this is Will Smith. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? I took, I took a selfie with, with the Fresh Prince. You know? I'm, 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 on, I'm on the 60th day of an 80-day trip around the world. I've been, I've been traveling around the world. I've been to Japan. I've been to South Africa. I've been to China. I've been to Ghana. I've been to Israel. I've been to Turkey. You know, I've been invited to speak in the House of Parliament. You know, I've, I've been doing events, I've, I've signed contracts which allow me to make more money than I ever would have made working in, in, in a law capacity. All my friends always call me and I just send them my contracts to deal with, you know what I mean? And that is all just stemmed from the power of me understanding that no one can dictate anything that I want to do. So if you don't take away anything, anything away from anything I said, all the jokes I made, I want you to take away the fact that do something you enjoy. Don't follow ideas, because when we're in school, we're taught ideas, we're taught concepts, and these ideas are great, but there's also ideals. Follow ideals, ideals are powerful. When you think of all these mathematical equations, maths is very interesting. You can find out why the equations were made is a lot more interesting than the results of the equations. You know, when you think about Archimedes and all these great philosophers, there's great stories behind why all these mathematicians came up with these, with these theories. The story of the, um, Einstein's theory of relativity, all these ideas behind them, all the ideals and what they were trying to do behind all these things were so powerful. And it's not because they were clever enough to figure out the equations that they were able to change the world. It's because they, were able, they strived for ideals that made a difference. There's a saying that always says that if you choose a job you love, you'll never have to work a day in your life. Most of you right now, if I ask most of you, who knows what they want to do when they're older? How, how many of you know what you want to do when you're older? Oh, that's really great. No, I'm actually, that's really cool. How many of you have something that you enjoy doing? It's, and, and, that's, and that's, there's some miserable people in this room who don't enjoy anything at all. <laughs> and, I, and, and I think that is more powerful than anything. 
Because enjoying something, it can be anything. You can enjoy eating. You can enjoy talking. You can enjoy watching How I Met Your Mother. It doesn't make a difference. <laughs> because, because when you enjoy something, there'll be a way to, to, for you to find something to do with it. If you enjoy doing these things, a passion will stem from it, an idea will come from it. But just because you're told that it's, it's, it's not conventional or it's not something you understand, it doesn't mean anything. Because education is not, like I said, regurgitating the facts and the figures. Education is understanding. Education is enjoyment. If you enjoy a particular subject in school, don't be limited to the fact that I get all A grades in this subject, so I love this subject. You can go outside of it and actually find an, an enjoyment outside of it, outside art. Your teacher tells you to paint this. Doesn't mean you just paint in class and that's gonna make you the best artist in the world. No, go out and learn. I see so many people say that I'm good at maths, but they can't handle, they don't have to calculate their tax. They don't have to do a mortgage, you know? They don't have to do the things that matter in the real world. And that's the most powerful thing I can say to you. If you enjoy something, pursue it. And pursue it hard because dreams change. Like you may have a dream and it always says that Men may not get to climb mountains, but their dreams will change and maybe they'll get to move them instead. Because the other day I got a message um, from somebody. I get a bit of message and she said, you know, Sully, you saved my life. You know, I was at a position where I didn't know what to do with my life. I wasn't sure what was going on. And I watched a video and it changed everything. And that made me feel quite good. So I started scrolling through my messages and I saw another message that said, yo, Sully, my relationship between my son was really bad. I didn't understand him, but you saved that relationship. Then I saw another message saying, you know, oh, me and my family, we never saw eye to eye. You saved my family. And I looked at all these messages and I was like, you know, shit, maybe I am some kind of superhero after all. <laughs> I want to leave you guys with one spoken word piece. This, this piece is one of my... Pardon? Oh, man, I've got to go. After we, I'll stay a little bit so we can answer a few questions, but I want to leave you with one spoken word piece just because it's one of my favourite, and it's one of my... This is the one that Will Smith saw, you know what I mean? So it has to be my favourite. <laughs> and I kind of changed it a little bit to suit the context of being in a um, performance environment. And it's, it's one of my more popular pieces it's called I Will Not Let an Exam Result Decide My Fate. And everything that I believe in is shaped within the context of these six, seven, eight minutes that I put, I put in, it's, you know, four or five minutes that I put into this, to this spoken word piece. And if you don't understand me or you don't understand any of my spoken word pieces, you can go back to that one and, also, and always understand my philosophy and ideology from that. We've got um, a little, thank you very much. <laughs> Come on, DJ Selector, wheel up. Could you turn it down a little bit, please? <laughs> not, not turn it off, turn it down, not off. <laughs> Just up slightly, unless you're gonna turn it off again. <laughs> All right, listen. Right now, there is a kid finishing parents' evening in a heated discussion with his mother, saying, why does he have to study subjects he will never, ever use in his life? And she will look at him, blank-eyed, stifle a sigh, think for a second, and then lie. She'll say something along the lines of, you know to get a good job, you need a good degree. And these subjects will help you get a good diploma. We never had this opportunity when I was younger. And he will reply, but you were younger a long time ago, weren't you, mum? And she won't respond, although what he implies makes perfect sense, that society's needs would have changed since she was 16. But she will ignore him, grip his hand more sternly, and drag him to the car. What she won't realise is, she won't lie just to shut him up. She won't ignore him because they were just returning from parents' evening and an argument in the hallway would look bad on her resume. 
Not because she's just spent the last one hour convincing a stern-faced teacher that she will ensure that her child studies more at home. No, she will lie simply because she does not know any better herself. Although her whole adult life, she has never used or applied Pythagoras' theorem, pathetic fallacy, and still does not know the value of X. She will rely on society to tell her that her child, who has one of the sharpest minds in the school, is hyperactive, easily distracted, and wayward. Listen. Why do you try and stop me? And ultimately he says, who writes my story? And who finds it for me? Because whatever you believe, your destiny is in your hands. You guys can shape that reality. No one may tell you, but I'm going to tell you. Because you can't let exams tell you what you're worth. Because exams are society's methods of telling you what you're worth. But you can't let society tell you what you are. Because it's the same society that tells you that abortion is wrong, but then looks down on teenage parents. The same society that sells products to promote natural hair, looks and smooth complexion, with the model on the box half Photoshop, has fake lashes and hair extensions. With pastors that preach charity, but own private jets. Imams that preach against greed, but all fat. Parents that say they want educated kids, but constantly marvel at how rich Richard Branson is. With governments that preach peace but endorse wars. If they believe so much in the importance of higher education and further learning, then why do they increase the tuition fees every single year? I believed Miss Jefferson when she took me into her office and said that my exams would be imperative to my success because we was taught to always follow when Miss Jefferson led. But then I took Jefferson out of the equation learn to think for myself, I realised he was taught to always follow when Miss led. <laughs> the irony. Just listen to the chorus. And I really want people to, to feel it. I don't know. I'm not too much of a musician, but if I ever did release something, it would be like this. It would be something that makes people feel something and know that Essentially, the world is your oyster. No one is going to decide anything for you. And you step out of this place today and you make that decision. Outside the classroom, outside everything. Because they can test us with tests, but the finals are never final. Because they never prepare us for the biggest test, which is survival. And what I suggest is fairly outlandish, so I don't expect everybody to understand this, except for the kids who knows what it feels like to be worth no more than a D or an A that you get on results day. The ones whose best stories were never good enough for their English teacher. Or the kid at the back of the class who thinks, why am I studying something that doesn't fuel my drive? But then when confronted with something else, his eyes come alive. So this one is for my generation. The ones who found what they were looking for on Google, followed their dreams on Twitter, pictured their future on Instagram, and accepted destiny on Facebook. This one's for my failures and my dropouts. This one's for my unemployed graduates. This one's for my sales assistants, cashiers and cleaners with bigger dreams. Because the purpose of why I hate school for love education was not to initiate a worldwide debate, but to let people know that whether you're 16 or 25, 30 or 55, you should not let anyone decide your I just appreciate you guys for having me. And you know, um, surely breaks that's S U S I B R E A K S. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc. I'm not sure how much time we have left, but 
I always think it's unfair if I just stand on the stage and talk the whole time and no one else gets to talk. So if you did want to ask any questions, if the time permits, um, I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Are we okay for time-wise? Two minutes? Oh, two minutes worth of questions, then that's cool. And I've got to take my selfie as well. I've got to take my selfie with all of you guys. That, that's, that's more important than the question. Yo, Drew, bring the camera so we can take a picture with these guys. But yeah, who is any questions that anyone wants to ask? Feel free, got you too, that's cool. I can't hear you. Oh yeah, yeah, after, that's cool, man. No worries, man. Sorry, she just wanted to ask a question. Who inspired me? I don't know. I, I often say that more than one person inspired me because I feel, feel in life there's so many different dynamics. So maybe when it came to like raising a family and being strong as an individual, it was probably my aunt because she raised all of us by herself. And then when it came to maybe being tenacious and having um, competitiveness, that would be someone who was maybe less accessible, like Michael Jordan. I often take my inspiration from lots of different areas to kind of accumulate and make me into who I am, as opposed to make me into just one individual. So there's lots of different people, like you guys inspired me today. So I really just take a, a lot of different ideas from many different places. Cool. Oh man, knowing where I am today, for me, is everything because um, I had a conversation with my little cousin before, I, before things started really taking off. And he said to me, yo, my mom keeps on saying, why aren't you going to do your law degree? She says we need to study to be successful. And I said to him, listen, like, you don't have to do anything. Just follow me. And if what I do does works out, then you know what's the right thing to do. Follow something you believe in. If it doesn't work out and I go back to cleaning, then you better finish school, you know what I mean? So. <laughs> So it's really, me being in this position right now, it means so much to me because it, it proves to them that you can, be, you can make something, you know? And it improves all the kids in my area the same thing. So yeah, it, it means a lot to me. Is that the bell? <laughs> that, I didn't, where's my camera? I didn't get to take the selfie. Oh, oh thank you, James. Very, thank you very much. What? Oh, what, what's this? Oh, I really appreciate that. Thank you, guys, man. I really appreciate it. Oh. Oh, Thank you. If, if you guys could just stand up and give me your best pose just for my selfie. Although it would be nothing like my selfie with a fresh prince, it would still be cool, man. You want to count in? I won't keep you guys much longer. Let's, let's go. One, two, three. Uh, uh, iPhone has an anti-climax. It doesn't flash anymore, so it's not drastic. But I'm, I'm going to tag this on Instagram. Ur Irvington, Irvington, um, hash Irvington Sully, which is S-U-L-I. So if you just check out the hashtag, you'll see me in it as well. Thank you guys very much. Take care. Enjoy yourself, man. Oh, yeah, come up, come up, man. Huh? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Oh, really? really? Yeah. Why do you stay for me? Reaching for mountains, still trying to hinder me. Who writes my story? Who plans this for me? Who writes my story? Why do you stay?